we were in uh, Santa Barbara in the spring. People got fatigued of, of the mass of the Milky Way within about three minutes of starting to talk about it. So hopefully we can get something interesting out of this. Um, so this is work that I've done uh, in collaboration with James Bullock at Irvine, as well as uh, some of the team at Space Telescope. So Tony Sohn, Roland Vandermarl, Gertina Bessel at Columbia, uh, and Steve Majewski at UVA. And also, as usual, there are simulations involved in this. So I'd like to thank the Aquarius, Via Lactea, and G-Halo collaborations for use of their data. OK, so to start, why do you care about the mass of the Milky Way? Uh, and even if you do, why is approximately 10 to the 12 solar masses not good enough? Well, of course, uh, variable mass estimates for the Milky Way range between something like, I don't know, half times 10 to the 12 to 2 or 3 times 10 to the 12. This is a factor of 4 or 5 in, in mass. And these result in very different expectations for galaxy formation models. And as an uh, important side note, I'll always be defining variable mass here with respect to 95 times the critical density. Um, so just as a couple of examples, let's think about the baryonic content of the Milky Way. So usually in galaxy formation models, the Milky Way has available to it the universal baryon fraction times its virial mass. Um, and so if the mass of the Milky Way is 7 times 10 to the 11, most or maybe even all of the Milky Way's baryons are accounted for by uh, observations. So it's easy to solve the missing baryons problem. Um, of course, if the mass is much larger, then most of the baryons are, in fact, missing. And these have very different uh, implications for galaxy formation models in terms of how do we understand whether a gas has to not be accreted onto a halo, whether it has to be expelled from a halo, whether it is sitting in a hot uh, gaseous phase, for example. Of course, another uh, example of where the, the mass of the Milky Way plays a main role in our understanding of galaxy formation is on the satellite scale. Because basically everything in terms of satellite abundance and the mass of satellites scales linearly approximately with the variable mass of the Milky Way. So that's another place where we need to start to understand better than just around 10 to the 12 solar masses, uh, the mass of the Milky Way, so we can interpret these potential small scale issues with uh, Lambda CDM. OK, so how do we try to measure the mass of the Milky Way usually? Well, uh, oftentimes this is using tracers of the Milky Way potential at as large a radius as possible. So generally this is done with stars, so say blue horizontal branch stars or RLI rays. In the galactic halo, these can be measured out uh, generally in large numbers to maybe 50 or 60 kiloparsecs, so this is with SDSS frequently. Uh, the density falls off pretty sharply though beyond 50 kiloparsecs or so. Um, Oleg Nedin has a sample of BHB stars that go out to about 80 kiloparsecs, and recently Alice Deason collaborators have a handful of stars even at larger radii. So I think there is potential in the future to use uh, these stars at even larger radii than around 50 kiloparsecs. But at present, it's a lot harder to constrain the mass distribution at larger than 50 kiloparsecs with these stars. If we want to use gas, I'd recommend not doing it. That's very hard to find at larger radii than 50 kiloparsecs in the Milky Way. Um, so satellite galaxies are an example of something that could be very useful for studying the mass distribution of the Milky Way. Even though there's only a small number of them, uh, they can be studied in great detail, of course, and so they're actually easy to pick out and target. So a couple of examples would be, say, the Magellanic Clouds, which are at uh, galactocentric distances of 50 or 60 kiloparsecs, likely falling into the Milky Way for the first time. So using models that try to reproduce, say, the orbit of the uh, clouds and producing the Magellanic Stream can help constrain the Milky Way mass. Another example of a satellite that could be helpful is LEO-1 which is the most distant classical dwarf spheroidal satellite. It's at a galactocentric distance of 260 kiloparsecs. And it's also basically the fastest moving galactic satellite in terms of radial velocity. So it has a galactocentric radial velocity of 175 kilometers a second. Uh, and just so that we're on the same page in terms of its properties, it's sort of a typical dwarf spheroidal. It has a velocity, one dimensional velocity dispersion of nine or so kilometers a second, stellar mass of a little less than 10 to the seven, half light radius of 400 parsecs. Now historically, because of this large distance and uh, high speed, it's played a very large role in, in constraining the mass of the Milky Way. Uh, 
And it's also led a lot of people to question, uh, is it actually a bound satellite or is it in some, some kind of interloper in the Milky Way halo? And whether or not that's the case will uh, change the mass estimate of the Milky Way quite strongly. In fact, up to 50% or more, just based on whether one assumes that LEO-1 is a bound satellite. So just to see how this would work, let's look at a radial phase space plot of uh, the Milky Way's classical satellites here. So this is now radial velocity. Negative radial velocity means that the satellite is moving in towards the galactic center. Positive radial velocity is moving away. These are, again, the classical satellites. I've also plotted on here uh, an escape velocity curve for an NFW potential with either uh, 10 to the 12 solar masses total in black or 7 times 10 to the 11 in blue. And our good friend LEO-1 is the satellite that sits here. So it's sort of the closest satellite to the escape velocity curve of the Milky Way, and that's why it's played an important role in, in setting the, the mass of the Milky Way from the satellite population. Okay, just so we can also see what the newly discovered satellites, the ultrafaints, look like on this plot. Uh, I've thrown them up here in magenta, so they look fairly similar. Uh, so I think the satellite population, at least that's traced by the classical satellites, doesn't look crazy relative to the um, ultrafaint satellites. But what we'd really like to know is the three-dimensional velocity of these things, not just the radial velocity. Uh, and this has actually been measured via proper motions for a small number of the Milky Way satellites. And those I've uh, marked in stars here and connected them to their uh, radial velocities. So I think one very interesting point is that all of the satellites with well-measured proper motions have tangential velocities that are larger than their radial velocities. Okay? Uh, and you might say, so what? You know, it probably should be larger. There's two dimensions that you can be tangential and only one radial. But of course, if LEO-1 has a tangential velocity that's substantially higher than its radial velocity, it would move it uh, significantly above this escape velocity curve, even for 10 to the 12 solar masses, and would probably mean that LEO-1 is an unbound satellite. So it'd be really nice to have an idea of what the 3D velocity of LEO-1 is. So wouldn't it be great if someone would go out and measure the proper motion for this thing? Uh, OK, well, I just might happen to know somebody who's done that. Uh, that's actually Tony Sohn and collaborators at Space Telescope. So in general, the proper motion measurements for Milky Way satellites have been limited by the number of background quasars with which to define an absolute reference frame. But the group at Space Telescope has now developed a technique to use background galaxies as the absolute reference frame instead, which allowed them to do the proper motion for M31 recently. Um, and so actually now we've got this for LEO-1 as well, five-year baseline with HST. So here's the result uh, in terms of microarc seconds per year. So it's moving at around 150 microarc seconds per year with an error of 40 or so microarc seconds. Now I'm sure this is all uh, very easy to convert into kilometers per second for everybody. But for people like me who have trouble with that uh, in more useful units, this means that the the radial velocity, which is basically known before, is around 170 kilometers a second with a very small error. The tangential velocity is substantial. It's 100 kilometers a second or so with an error of about 30 kilometers a second, but smaller than the radial velocity. So it's not on a radial orbit, but it's not on a highly uh, circular orbit either. So OK, the final number then uh, that we'd get from the proper motion measurements here of LEO-1 is the total velocity is around 200 kilometers per second. Okay, so this is, uh, this is basically the most important number that will be used throughout the talk here. And you can sort of see what the errors are. This is a one sigma error of basically plus or minus 20 kilometers a second. The two sigma errors can go quite high. They can't go very low because it's hard to get lower than the radial velocity. So if I go back and put this now on the uh, circular velocity or the uh, velocity phase space diagram here, LEO-1 sits at where the star is uh, in this plot. So it may not look very impressive, right? This is only moved up very slightly because it's uh, on sort of a on more of a radial orbit than any of these other satellites. But in terms of measuring the mass of the Milky Way, this is actually a great advance because we don't have to worry about it being uh, very high up here or quite low down here. 
So what does this mean for the Milky Way variable mass? Well, what I'd like to do is use simulations to try to interpret this motion of LEO1 and get a constraint on the Milky Way variable mass. So what, this, what I've got here is a phase space now in terms of total velocity. I've scaled uh, quantities by their variable quantities. So this is the 3D, the spatial velocity relative to the variable velocity of the host. This is the radius relative to the host. And the black points are data from the Aquarius simulation. Now, you, the first thing you can sort of see is that in these Aquarius simulations, unbound subhalos are extremely rare. Okay, there's three subhalos here that you can sort of see that are unbound, and they're all part of an infalling group here. That's something like a LMC-like object falling in for the first time. But less than 0.1% of the subhalos in the simulation are unbound. No, it's, it's large enough that it's all within the high resolution region here. Um, so I'd say in these simulations, at least, it's very unlikely that we'd find uh, LEO1 as an unbound satellite of the Milky Way. So where do we put LEO1 on this plot? Well, here's LEO1 uh, for several different values of the virial mass, ranging between 7 times 10 to the 11 and 2 times 10 to the 12. I think the first thing you can see is for these low mass Milky Way models, say 7 times 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12 solar masses, there's almost no subhalos that lie in the same part of phase space as LEO1. Okay. As you get up to a higher mass, you start to see more and more subhalos that seem to agree with the properties of LEO1. So this is why LEO1 uh, sort of pushes the Milky Way mass higher. Now, if we want to get a quantitative constraint, what we can do is take something like a constant energy contour. Uh, for the 3D velocity of LEO1. So this is uh, where, how LEO1 would move uh, in energy space. Everything above that is less bound than LEO1. Everything below that is less bound, or sorry, more bound than LEO1. So if we use something like this and just ask what's the probability of a given subhalo being more bound or less bound than LEO1, take, full, take into account the full Monte Carlo phase space uh, errors for LEO1's proper motion, we can start to derive a mass for the Milky Way. So one possibility is to ask what's the probability of finding LEO1 is the least bound out of a sample of 11 satellites. So take the classical satellites and ask if you sample that phase space with 11, how often do you find that LEO1 is the least bound? If you do that, you find a posterior distribution for the mass of the Milky Way that looks like this. Uh, with a median mass of about 1.5 times 10 to the 12 and a 90% confidence interval that basically goes between 1 and 2 times 10 to the 12 solar masses. Now, I'd argue this is a quite a conservative estimate because we actually don't know that LEO1 is the least bound classical satellite. There's only um, proper motions for a few of them, and as I mentioned before, the ones for which we have proper motions, all of them uh, have larger tangential velocities than their radial velocities. So we could also ask, OK, for the ones that we don't have proper motions, let's just marginalize over all of those and ask uh, what happens if we just say there's between 0 and 5 additional classical satellites at least as energetic as LEO1. Then we get a median posterior value of something like 2 times 10 to the 12 for the mass of the Milky Way. And the 90% confidence interval gets a much higher upper bound, something like 5 times 10 to the 12. But the lower bound, again, remains something like 1 times 10 to the 12. So I'd say, in general, the best constraint that we'll get for the Milky Way here is on the lower bound for the mass, and that we find at 95% confidence the variable mass of the Milky Way should be above 0.95 times 10 to the 12. I think this is basically independent of assumptions about the number of fast-moving satellites. So now, uh, we all know that Aquarius was done with cosmology that is a little bit out of date, so it's WMAP1 cosmology. We might worry that maybe this is influencing our results. So fortunately, there are a couple of other very high-resolution simulations, uh, Via Lactea 2 and G-Halo. You can see that they populate the phase space in terms of total velocities in exactly the same way that the Aquarius subhalos do. Furthermore, there's also no sort of uh, unbound satellites in these simulations either. So I think that the cosmology dependence is not going to be an issue at all with this uh, sort of um, methodology for measuring the mass of the Milky Way. One other interesting aspect of this phase space is that it's very stratified based on infall time of the satellites. 
So if you ask when a satellite fell in with the Big Bang happening at time zero in this plot and the present day happening at 13.7 uh, giga years or so, and you color the satellites according to their infall time, you see that very early infalling satellites all populate these uh, highly bound regions, so lowish velocities, whereas satellites that are just falling in now populate a very narrow range of orbital energies. Okay. So these are the recently accreted satellites in black. And if you look at where LEO-1 sits on this for various different halo masses, you can see that it's fairly consistent with this recent infall for our sort of preferred-ish value of 1.5 times 10 to the 12, which is also very consistent with its star formation history. It seems to have a burst of star formation around two giga years ago, probably corresponding to a pericentric pass around the Milky Way. Now, just to show that it's important to have these 3D velocities to have proper motions, this is not information that you get at all with just radial velocities. So here I've taken only subhalos that fell in within the last four giga years to the, to the um, halo at, in question. You can see, again, that phase space is very well stratified for those objects in, in terms of total velocity, but if you just look at the radial velocities, you have no information there. Um, so, in my last minute or two, I'd just like to go through some possible implication of this sort of 1.5 times 10 to the 12 solar mass Milky Way, if that's what the number um, actually is. So, in that case, the baryonic allotment of the Milky Way would be around 2 or so times 10 to the 11 solar masses of baryons. And the observed baryonic content is something like 7 times 10 to the 10 modulo a bit, I'd say. So, missing a substantial amount of baryons in terms of typical galaxy formation models. And there's sort of three possibilities if this is the case. Either they never made it in, they made it in and got thrown out, or they're sitting in the halo in an undetected hot phase. And obviously, this is, uh, has very different implications for understanding of uh, gas physics and galaxy formation, these three possibilities. So uh, Tao Tao Fang has led some work that we've been doing recently constraining the possibility of, of the last point that there maybe there's an undetected hot phase in the Milky Way um, of a hot corona. So you could think about three possible models. One is sort of a local disk for hot gas. This would be low mass. Uh, so basically it would contribute negligibly to the baryon content. If you look at the, the gas and say what's the possibility for it sitting in a... a a dark matter halo-like distribution, so an NFW profile out to large radii, well then you find that a hot halo around the Milky Way can't hold very much baryonic mass at all. It's a very small fraction of the missing baryons would be possible to hide there. So that's also consistent with what Anderson and Bregman have said. But if you put things in a more extended core distribution of gas, you can actually put most or all of the baryons uh, that we'd expect to be in the Milky Way in this hot phase and have everything be consistent with observational constraints. And I'm out of time, so I can't really uh, describe them, but just to show uh, this black line is, is this extended distribution of baryons that has the universal baryon fraction in the Milky Way, and it's uh, certainly consistent with all the observational constraints that we can find. So just to conclude, I'd argue that pinning down the virial mass of the Milky Way is very important for understanding galaxy formation. Uh, LEO-1 historically has been the important satellite for doing this. And now finally, uh, based on SON et al., we have a proper motion measurement which significantly reduces the uncertainty in the parameter space there. Using that, we've basically found uh, a, po a range of possible best fit values for the mass of the Milky Way. This depends a little bit on what you assume for the number of satellites and their, how bound they are. But what we find is pretty robust is that at 95% confidence, we always get that the Milky Way should be more massive than 0.95 times 10 to the 11 solar masses. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you.